If, when you look up at the sky, you ever feel small, crushed by the weight of the immensity, then tell yourself that there, it exists nearby, a world that makes you true giants. It is here, within reach. You could almost touch it with your finger. And it is in this universe of the infinitely small, inaccessible to our eyes, and yet just as vast and mysterious as the immensity of the heavens that we are now going to dive into, starting by reducing ourselves by a factor of 100. At this scale, we can now scrutinize a bee in detail, here covered with small piles of pollen, and near which is a snowflake and a grain of salt. To season our dishes, we use hundreds of them and each one is two to five times larger than a typical mite that can be found by the thousands in our blankets, our pillows. The largest of them are at the limit of what a human with a keen eye is capable of perceiving. And this has nothing to do with it, but it's also roughly the thickness of your cornea. And now we are at the level of a human ovum whose width is on the order of a haircut into slices or a plant cell. At the scales we are now at, we can come across Paramecia and Euglenus. For us to be able to distinctly perceive an organism of this type with the naked eye, without the assistance of microscopes, we would need to enlarge the droplet in which it wanders to give it a diameter of about 10 meters. At this stage, we are now approaching the dimensions of the largest animal cells, but also the pollen grains that we saw agglomerated by hundreds, by thousands on the legs of our bee. And here we are facing white blood cells that ensure our immune defences, here compared in size to red blood cells, and to the head of a spermatozoid, which is, itself, twice as small as the microscopic droplets that make up clouds and from which millions of ice crystals form and assemble, which, by aggregating, give us our snowflakes. And to be up to the subject, we will have to continue to dive, reducing ourselves again by a factor of 10, to discover what paramecia feed on. We are now facing a small bacterium, here the size of a micrometer. For these living organisms, a typical animal cell is as imposing in size as a large building is to us, most of whose constituents are much more imposing than it. But by delving too much into the minuscule, we almost lose the enormity. And to take its measure, to try to touch the dimensions we are now at, imagine that squeezed against each other, bacteria like these, we could fit without overlapping 100 million on the surface of a fingernail. As for my index finger, it would be for her. What is for me, a wall of about 50 kilometers. From then on, my forearm becomes a small country when we find ourselves at the size of a bacterium. To get from there to there at a forced march with such dimensions, it would take you nearly two weeks to progress through marked reliefs, zigzagging between baobab hairs and crevasses worthy of imposing canyons. But the most fascinating thing about all this is perhaps that the smallest of these organisms remains two to 50 times larger than a virus. For it, a mitochondrion is in size what a container ship is for you. And mitochondria like this one, there are about a thousand in each human cell. However, even the smallest of these viruses remain nearly 10 times larger than a double helix of deoxyribonucleic acid. In the distance that separates these two strands, one could line up 10 water molecules. To reach the thickness of a hair, you would need to add another 500,000. A water molecule, roughly, is very small. As small as we are, humans, in terms of size, closer to an object like the sun than to one of these molecules, by a factor of 10. In a 30 centiliter glass, there are something like 10 million billion billion of them. But there are even smaller things, because by zooming in on these constituents, we get to the scales of the atom. And from there, our journey is going to take a whole different turn. By crossing this symbolic boundary of the order of a tenth of a nanometer, we are going to start diving into a form of disbelief. We have entered the hallucinated bestiary of particles that make up atoms. You who enter here, leave behind common sense and abandon all hope. Of representing things accurately, because subatomic particles never stop behaving in ways that go beyond what we can visually represent. And to avoid melting the brains of those venturing here for the first time, let's say there is a central nucleus around which electrons revolve. But the nature and behavior of these do not correspond at all to the type of movement to which the world around us has accustomed us. In the infinitely small wanting to be too visual, we risk to fall from a great height 
nothing that we show you resembles an atom. These electrons are not really rotating. Although we could say that even in calm, they are moving at some 2,100 kilometers per second around their nucleus, making an average of this number of turns per second. To get closest to the reality of these excited particles, one must accept losing their footing, no longer knowing which to focus on. Because electrons are also wave packets, non-point particles, dimensionless, of which we cannot know both the speed and the position at the same time. To realize what they really are, we would need to talk about probabilities of presence, trying to represent all the regions where we are most likely to find them. And as we continue to delve into this strange environment where events unfold in time spans that make a nanosecond an eternity, we are now approaching the center, the nucleus, where we find protons and neutrons. And this whole thing is 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. To put it another way, the size differences between an atom and the elements that make it up are on the order of those that separate the dimensions of a small virus from a cell, a cell from a bee, a bee from a building. If the nucleus components were increased to one meter in diameter, while keeping all proportions, the electrons would be orbiting a few hundred kilometers away. And you could get lost because it's so immense. Because here is practically all the mass of the atom in this incredibly dense core. If in a volume the size of a dice, we were to fill the 99.9999999999999% of emptiness by adding nuclei to the point of filling all the available space, we would end up with a dice weighing 200 million tons. In short, the nucleus is impressive to the power. These things, atoms, make up all the material things we know, and in quantities that we absolutely cannot represent. Take a bowling ball and imagine for a second, thank you, that the atoms inside it are reduced to the size, let's say, of a marble. Then, all proportions kept, the bowling ball would end up being the size of the Earth. If you were to have fun extracting with tweezers all the atoms that make you up, you would recover something like seven times 10 to the power of 27 atoms. It is thought that there are between 100 and 10,000 times more of these things in a human than there are stars in the observable universe. Another way to put their unreasonable quantity into perspective is to remember that the number of cells in your body is of the same order of magnitude as the number of atoms in one of these cells. In short, these little things are the change of scenery next door. These are the small bricks that make up all the big ones. But are these bricks also immense compared to what may still await us? Because if we have long thought of atoms as the ultimate bricks, we later discovered that they contained electrons and a nucleus, itself made up of protons and neutrons, themselves made up of quarks. Elements that are, in some ways, even more inaccessible than a trip to the moon. Because it took us longer to go from the electron to the quark, using our particle accelerators, than it did from the invention of the first rockets to the first human steps on our satellite. And all of this to get us from there to here. At the scales we are now, the size of a human is a hundred times more imposing to a quark than the distance that separates us from the closest star to the sun for us. But even so close, or rather far, in the infinitely small, have we reached a limit? Is there a moment where no more doors open? where we end up bumping into an ultimate, indivisible brick? Can we dive infinitely, like in an endless Russian doll game? Well, we don't really know. And that's why we're going to stop our dive here, by continuing it. Because in reality, from our original size, we have only made a third of the way towards the smallest hypothetical particles that some physicists suspect exist. And that's perhaps the most dizzying part of this story because no matter how small we are now, we may still be very far from the end. Assuming there is one, it is currently and theoretically located here, at the so-called Planck length. This length is so small that we are, proportionally speaking, a million times closer in terms of size to the largest thing found in the universe, that is, the observable universe itself, than to the smallest division that current theoretical physics allows. And that it's still huge.